And it was him doing a lap dance for the devil. Okay. And I just, I, I, you know, it's one of those situations where you're like, this stinks. Here, smell it. So, right, right, so right. my bass player. And everybody came, has to. Yeah, my bass player came in and we're, I'm talking about it. If I was like, what are you talking about? I'm like, here, watch. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And he watched it and he was not happy about it. And he's like, why did you do this to me? And I'm like, well, because I had to suffer. Hey, guys, my name is Jeff McMahon and I play the piano for people. I've played on some big records, played on some big stages, and I've played with some big stars. Big or small, they're all the same. Taking someone with a dream, playing their song, and trying to get them further up the ladder. So that's what we'll do here. Have a conversation, maybe shine a light, and play some music. And I'll be on piano. This is McMahon on Keys. <laughs> no, I know they have those podcasts, but this is not one of those. I've done some that, that I'm like, I'm so on my toes about. You know, you're just kind of like, I don't know. I'm so deep in on this. Just whatever. <laughs> oh, yeah. yeah. No, I was, um, I listened to some of them and I know it's like, it's a podcast. So, you know, all the rules are gone. And I'm like, I know, but I'm, I can't. You have to have some decorum. You know? <laughs> I got to get to a real word. Yeah. Um, Rick Monroe, uh, when you got here, I was, I was telling you that I was trying to figure out why do I know Rick Monroe? Why do I know Rick Monroe? Because you were saying that you had done some shows with Jada Dreyer. Yeah. Um, what were you, what were you doing then? Cause was, I was on the road with her at the time. All right. It was the Jägermeister yeah. tour and okay. it was Eric church was actually the headliner. Okay. And, um, on that tour I was, I'd play acoustic. I'd open. Yeah. I'd also MC it at the same time. So I was kind of doing a little bit of everything. Yeah. So I would like introduce bands. I'd play in between. I'd do all kinds of stuff. Right. So, which was awesome because Jaeger gave me my own bus to cruise around. Just me and my acoustic. It was okay. kind of ridiculous. But I think I think actually it was St. Louis that we played with you guys. Okay. Um, is it the Pantages or the Pan, something something like it that? It wasn't that Pantages is a theater down there, right? It, and it's not. A, yeah, it was something like that it was. Yeah. But it was like in that same neighborhood yeah. because I totally remember that she was. She did at least one, if not two, dates. But right. that was something that we had done. Well, and I remembered as I was like doing homework, um, you did a, an interview with Missy from Center Stage. Mm -hmm around that time so i was trying to put it all together so thank you for saving me on that yeah um okay i heard you make this mention and i don't i don't know the story because i know your music i knew your stuff when I, I think it's safe to say it was a little more conventionally country than right. some of your stuff is now um but uh i heard you mention in an interview jim croce yeah okay now why i'm a piano player i couldn't even tell you why but jim croce life and times was the first record album i ever bought with my own money when i was a child i still know all those songs why did i hear you mention jim croce when i was a kid my mom had the records and i just remember that that those were just some of my favorite records to listen to yeah so I, I don't know how, I don't know if she was something she kind of turned me on to, but um, one, of, one thing that happened was pretty cool. Years later, I was um, doing some promotional stuff and I went to San Diego and I played on a, a TV show, morning show. And uh, if you know that there's a, a, the Lamp District or something, Lamp Lighter District that's down there, okay. there's a place called Croce's. Okay. And, and it, like, it's where her son AJ plays. Right. And, and it's, so I'm on there and I actually started talking about how much I love Jim Croce. His wife got my number from the station and called me at home. And it was the funniest thing because my poor wife, I'm like, you wouldn't believe who just called me, Jim Croce's wife. And I was like a little kid. I was completely enamored with the fact that, yeah, yeah, yeah. and she's like, I, thank you so much for remembering my husband and talking about him. And if you ever come down, you can play AJ's. We'd love to have you come down here and play Cro you know, Croce's. And yeah, yeah, yeah. So that's, uh, that was kind of a cool thing. I mean, I just, how can you not love the man? He's got some of the best, like just structured songs ever and I, one of the craziest stories i ever heard and i'm not sure if it's true was he had a deal was basically at the end of his deal his wife was pregnant he mm -hmm. was a handyman and they looked at him and said you need something to hit now or you're done 
And he okay. sat down at his uh, dining room table and wrote Time in a Bottle, Bad, Bad Leroy Brown, and something like three or four of his major hits right. like that night. Wow. And you know, the rest is history. Well, and uh, and what's so great about those those records is they were certainly not lush. No, you know they're not like the records now, where just throw everything on there. It would be him and that acoustic yeah. player buddy of his, and uh, and that's it. The rest of it's just the song. And you had like Rick Morata played a couple of the tracks on there, yeah. but not a lot. There's not a lot of drum stuff. Funny thing is, if you watch them live, that guitar player watches his mouth because their harmonies are insane right um my bass player and i have watched a bunch of videos of them because we do a lot of acoustic stuff together and he's like have you noticed as jim plus jim's just an amazing player and the lead player was insane yeah yeah, yeah. but they would they would they would kind of face each other like this more so and the guy was watching every word so their harmonies were always perfect right it's pretty cool well um crochi like I said, for whatever reason, I connected to that early. Um, I find it so interesting because I know you, I don't know if you struggle with this necessarily, <laughs> but you're confronted a lot with what I think is ridiculous. That whole, is it country? Is it not country? Is it rock? Is it not? And I understand critics have to have something to talk about. Everybody can't like the Avengers because everybody else has already found it. <laughs> right. They've got to like something that nobody's ever heard of before. But um, it seems so unnecessary to me because I know that, you know, you've got the whole Jim Croce thing. Um, and I want to talk about your record. But one of the things I noticed about your record is that you've got Dan Dugmore yeah. on the record who all the musicians know as a steel guitar player, electric guitar player, he played for Stevie Nicks. He played for all that Linda Ronstadt and James Taylor stuff in the beginning. He played for Montgomery Gentry, um, which all of that is in your wheelhouse, Yeah, but the musicians don't have to choose. So how do you speak to that conflict or do you even feel like it's a conflict? I know you get asked about it. Yeah. You know, are you country? Or are you not country? How do you address that knowing that it's kind of a ridiculous question? Honestly, or do you think it's ridiculous? I think it's totally ridiculous. Okay. And at this time, I don't care anymore. Right. I mean, I used to care when I was trying to like market myself a certain way. Right. But now at this point, man, I do what feels good. Right. I do what feels right. I do what emotionally makes me happy musically i've been around i've done it long enough to where i don't have to do anything other than what i really feel is the right thing right i've got a group of musicians around me who all want to do the same thing i'm super fortunate in that way i was always told play music because you love it right period not because you want to be successful or why you must play music because you love to play music right i'm gonna play music till the day i die doesn't matter famous or not doesn't matter that being the case life is short why not do what you love so why care what anybody else says? I mean, yeah, I know it needs to be marketed a certain way, but I think that our music, if we're true, if I'm true of what I say, if I'm true of what I write, if I perform it honestly, it will connect with people. And that's all you can hope for. I think, you know, you can kind of come and go with the fads and do these different things. But if you just be as honest as you can, I think it'll work out. And so that's kind of where I'm at. I mean, I, yeah, I, I used to be like, well, it's kind of got this and it's got that feel. And now I'm just kind of like, yeah, listen to it. If you like it, great. If not, cool. Yeah. There's other stuff. And, um, you know, and the biggest thing is my band is so spread out. We have one from Seattle, one from upstate New York, one from Kentucky, and one from Florida. Right. And they're all a huge influence into this record. Well, and all of us that started playing music as kids wound up getting connected to all sorts of different kinds of music because right. we were doing everything we could at the time to stay plugged in. Yeah. So now you're talking about your guys, the yeah. hitmen, right? I'm I'm not exactly sure how this went down. It seems like it seems like when things got quiet, your guys were all there and you were all content to yeah. you know stay together. And I, I I want you to they're all on the record. Yeah now and 
I'm assuming that was kind of part of the agenda in the same way that for us, you know, I, I worked with Tim McGraw for a long time and it was a very intentional thing when he decided to hold the band together and take us into the studio. That was a I'm big deal. I'm assuming the Hitmen is the yeah. same kind of thing. Well, the biggest thing about it was, is we, we'd come back, it was COVID basically that kind of did it because we were touring the West Coast. As soon as we came back, everything shut down. I remember everybody was kind of hanging out with who you were already hanging out with. Right. And you didn't want to kind of like, you wanted to keep your circle because no one knew what was going on. So we kept our circle amongst ourselves and started being like, well, let's start writing songs. Right. Let's start practicing more. Let's, hey, let's start streaming. We know we can start doing streaming stuff. Alan and I had a standing Tuesday write, just kept writing and writing. Band kept getting more involved with it. People kept getting more and more as we streamed and they started learning my own material and other stuff. It just started feeling right. And when um, Malcolm Springer approached us to do an album, mm -hmm. when we got in there, it was just, it felt like, well, this is a band. You know, I mean, this it definitely feels more like a band situation than anything else. So they're like, well, what are we going to come up with? And I was like, well, these guys kill it every night. So it's Rick Monroe and the Hitmen. And it just kind of became the, the thing. I was looking back at the list of the songs that you cut with the Hitmen. And I'm, I'm trying to remember. I'm, I'm going to get the, the titles confused. I, I want to say it's World's Gone Crazy. Yeah. You, can, you can tell me. But... um. Of the the songs that are coming out as a part of this project, I want to say that I heard you say that "World's Gone Crazy" was one of the last songs that you found, or something. Yeah, it was um, well, because we when we got the record as we were going through, we actually it's funny because we still have a bunch of tracks that are still from that session that aren't right. even done or partially done. But I remember Malcolm was like, "Well, we need another rocker," so I'm like, "All right," and so Alan came over. You know, we sit there in my office, we, you know, we go through ideas and I just finished watching Little Nas X and I, I blocked the name of the okay. song out. Yeah, yeah. And it was him doing a lap dance for the devil. Okay. And I just, I, you know, it's one of those situations where you're like, this stinks, here, smell it. So right, right, right. my bass player- And everybody has to. Yeah, my bass player came in <laughs> and we're, I'm talking about it. Finally, I was like, what are you talking about? I'm like, here, watch. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And he watched it and he was not happy about it. And he's like, why did you do this to me? And I'm like, well, because I had to suffer. And we started talking about the world is just insane. I mean, you know, Nas X was selling shoes with blood in it. Right. And I said, the world is just crazy. And yeah. it was like, dang, that is that is the whole thing. And of course, Dancing with the Devil is part of it. And yeah. then that all became part of the song. And so that was the, um, you know, the catalyst to create. Well, well here's, here was my question about that song. You've got 11 songs on this album. That was the second song from this collection that you released. Yeah. But it was one of the last ones you found. So I'm assuming instead of sending tracks to people and everybody cutting it separate, did you cut this project as a band? As a band. Because that because if you're releasing the first, the song that you found last, it sounds like everybody was in a studio together working out parts. We were. We did all the pre-production. Yeah. Like you're supposed to. We all sat in the room and did it. I mean, everybody was in the room doing it. Yeah, you know? yeah, yeah. So that's what we, and that's how we've been doing it. Even when we write and do those kind of things, we might go into production studios and use e drums and stuff, but we still try to stay together. We did do one track late on this record with Peter Keys, mm -hmm. which is One More Day, which was, that was actually kind of one of like the last songs that we kind of found. And um, that was, you know, old school, same thing. And Peter Keys plays for Leonard Skinner. Right. And so we did it at his studio. And um, and the new stuff we're already we're actually already cutting a new record because mm -hmm. we have so much material. And same thing, we all went in and cut it and did all the basic tracks so far. Now, prior to that, did you cut as a band on a previous project? And everything else was Studio Cats. Yeah. Pretty much everything else has always been kind of doing you know the, the standard Nashville yeah. way, where you got you know you get seven or eight people, you go in basically cutting sides and they right. cut all the stuff and whatever i gotta fix this oh, i'm gonna do my acoustic track now and then it's done you walk away with kind of a which is awesome but i think having the opportunity to sit around and work out like ideas like oh, i need this and, oh yeah totally you know i think it's a little i yeah. think you get i think the idea of, of when bands used to go in and burn through tape or whatever it was to create music i think gave you a little bit more depth to it you know, and that's, that's what we're trying to recreate 
with no budget. <laughs> well, and that's, well, no budget, but you invest the time. Time. It's all sweat equity. The time, yeah. I mean, that's what, when we did that first record, and that's that's why I was asking the question, because it's what it looked like from the song order, mm-hmm. and it's what it sounds like. You know, there's not 20 solos that you threw away. Yeah. Because you you get to work out the parts, and I know my piano part was made because we worked out what are you going to do? How is what I'm going to do going to dance with what you right. do? We don't just throw it all out there and then just kind of like throw mix up the away. Yeah. Right, and then, right, right. then I think a lot of times you'll get guys that have standard licks that they're going to play and they're great. But I remember the, one of the first times I listened to a demo and they're like, oh, that's such and such on the demo. Right. And you're like, well, I don't want you to know what players are on the demo as much as I want you to listen to this song. Right. But a lot of people can tell because that's just their style. Well, with us now, we're creating a style that is completely like unique to us you know and I, and that i love and what with the new record we've been writing all the songs and doing really good demos of them mm-hmm. you know and then doing work tapes and demos sending them around and let everybody kind of work out their parts and then we all get together and talk about it and it's like oh bobby what well, that's an awesome guitar part you just came up with and so when we go in to cut it all that's already figured out right you know and then obviously we're going to build from there well um okay so you've put this whole thing together yeah. now you got Jim Croce, you got Dan Dugmore, who I was following in 40 years ago on Linda Ronset's second record. You've got all this authentic, old school influence, yep. you know, recording as a band. <laughs> Whoa. Okay. So you've got vinyl. Yeah, we did vinyl finally. I'm okay. so excited. Now, um, I will go buy a turntable for <laughs> this. Awesome. Um why? Well, the guy, when we went into look, because we, we were kind of flirting with the idea. A um, couple of reasons why is because our distribution company just stepped up to be Virgin. Mm-hmm. So, and they're like, we can put stuff in stores. I'm like, okay, well, that's, that's a new wrinkle that we haven't dealt with. We've been doing everything digitally. And I'm like, the opportunity to go into stores gives you a whole different aspect of how do you market what you do. Right. But when we went into look at the place, the guy said, an album has to occupy a space in your life. And I thought that really resonated with me. I'm like, it, it's not just something that's on your phone that you can stream. You have to take it, put it in a place. You have to have a place to play it. You have right. to, it occupies an actual space in a person's life. Right. And I mean, that's what you want music to do, right? You want to occupy a portion of their life in, in, in a positive way. But, but that, I was like, man, that's, you sold me. Okay, I want to do it. <laughs> you know, I want to be part of that. And um, it's the best thing we've ever done. The thing, when you talk about occupying a space in your life, that's what people younger than us don't remember, is you used to have to commit to this album because buying this one meant not buying another yeah, something one. else. Yeah. And you now might have you, had to wait in line for one of those. You might yeah. have had to you know, order it from somewhere else. I mean, yeah, all yeah, kinds yeah. of crazy stuff. Well, thank you for this. Yeah. Now... Um, I went through all of the stuff. I know World's Gone Crazy is kind of a, a highlight. You're dropping one of the songs tomorrow that we're going to share yeah. uh, here in a little bit. Which we did a really cool rendition. Um, you, you're well, really good, man. You. <laughs> you, my friend. And the vocalist, she was amazing. Like, yeah. that was so, that was, that was a really, uh, yeah, it was a nice treat. Maddie True. Yeah. Yeah. She was awesome. Yeah, she's she's good. She's good. But yeah, that one's Which Way Is Home. That's actually the second song that Alan and I wrote. Okay. You know, that's like Trouble was the first one, and Which Way Is Home was the second one we wrote. And it's funny that how many of the songs have been making making the records, you know. Well, and to put together a record that you want to be based on performance, that I'm assuming your kind of bread and butter is take it out there and perform it. Yes. Um, is there a a better wrap up to this album than which way is home? I don't think so. I think it's the, well, the funny thing too, and this is kind of why we did it, which I learned this doing an album. Yeah. You only have 22 um, minutes per side. So you, that's, you get 22 minutes per side. Right. You can maybe push a little bit. And also the more aggressive stuff needs to be out on the outside because of bigger grooves, shorter the grooves, the less you need, that you need less dynamic stuff. I didn't know that. Or less heavy stuff is what they, they, um, they tell you that's what you should do. Yeah. So it's kind of funny because we had to think of it that way. And how do you actually look at the songs and go, 
okay, this is going to give us close to 22 minutes. And that's what we ended up doing. That's how we put the thing together. That's how you have to put them together. Okay. That's why I think older bands, you know, when they were doing nothing but vinyl would have those one minute weird songs. Mm -hmm. Cause it'd be like, well, I got a minute of vinyl to burn. Let's, you know, yeah, let's yeah, make yeah. some crazy, you know, noodling thing or something. Or they had super long songs. Cause they're like, well, you know, we have 22 minutes. Let's do a song. All men brothers. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, and I mean, of course we know this. Once upon a time, there were 45s, which were singles. That was one song. Um, that's why conventional wisdom became that being a three-minute song. Right. Because that's how much you could fit on those. So do you yeah. know why there's a top 40? I do not. Why do you think? There could have been a top 35. I, I, do, know, I, I do not know. Because the, the old jukeboxes, the Wurlitzer jukeboxes, I, I don't know if this is true. I, I, I want to believe it's true. So, what, they could only have 40 records? They, they could hold 40 records, so they would put the most popular 40 songs oh, that makes sense, in the jukeboxes because that's how they made the most money. And were, were those jukeboxes able to do like side A, side B as well? I couldn't tell you. Because I know a lot of stuff was like they had B-sides, which was yeah. even funnier. You know? Probably so. Yeah, yeah. I'm sure so because huh. you could flip them over. We're getting we're getting a nod from from the wings over here. <laughs> yes, your people are affirming. Says, yeah. So, am I right on on my storytelling over here? Yeah. That's amazing. Okay. Well, but it, but yeah. the funny thing is too is the resurgence of these are amazing, and that's the other thing yeah. that sold us. We went into the manufacturer, and up first, I'm kind of like, ah, you know, maybe we'll do CDs. You know, we'll do this kind of thing. And I looked up, and there was a wall of George Strait records. There was yeah. a wall of Cody Jinx records. There was a wall of Pussifer records which my bass player got all excited about. There was a wall of Fleetwood Mac records that these guys were manufacturing like massive amounts of these bands. And I was like, okay, well, obviously there's a market. And he's like, it's, there's a huge market. right? And then we're starting to kind of understand that, that it's a whole different thing. And I think we're the type of band that this will fit us a lot better than just the streaming thing. I think this, this is kind of this will allow us to be more of who we are without having to fit into any box. Right. This is the box that we now create for ourselves. So tomorrow is is the last single of this journey. Yes. Um, is this available tomorrow? Yeah, it'll it'll all be available. Um, you can go to. I know it's online at stores. It'll be at physically at stores. You can go to our website, rickmonroe.com go there because you know it's direct to us okay. and, and the cool thing is if you come to our website you'll get it autographed like the ones that are at the store are just wrapped and everything but the ones we we put some extra stuff in there and and make them unique for everybody so um mine's autographed already here's our and plus the other thing that's really cool every single disc is unique everyone's a different color because they gave us a chance to either do it just a black disc or just randomize right and we're like well randomize and so every is single one yeah. Can we show it? Yeah. So this Real will quick. be, you can see all the different colors. It's it's pretty crazy. Yeah, you do it. You know yep. what you're dealing with there. All right. So this one. Oh, wow. Yeah. That's cool. I mean, some of them are translucent. Some of them are. Uh, and so the good thing is we only did a, a, a limited run of these. So once this is over, we'll probably go to a standardized color, like pick a color, right? And the rest from there. So if you have to get the first run to get the um, to get these. Cool. Well, okay. I want you to point out some of these songs. All right. But we've already talked about the one song. Yeah. So let's go ahead and show them that. Yeah. And um, then you can kind of run us down what the greatest hits are going to be on this record. They're my kids. I love them all. <laughs> <laughs> Come on. <laughs> So this is Which Way is Home? From L.A. to Memphis Man, I tried Nashville, Tennessee Gone miles and miles Chasing crazy dreams And I've been near heaven Or damn close enough to fly Waiting for my moment To stand in the light And when will I see Where I'm supposed to be 
and when will I know which way is home and no ocean sunrise all painted desert sky now I've seen so much more than my share of life there have been good and bad times Chasing a right ride To feed my gypsy soul And when will I see Where I'm supposed to be And when So that's which way is home. Yeah. Now, um, we still passed on that. Dude, you guys are awesome. Thank you for uh, okay. making it sound good. Well, I don't hear <laughs> I don't hear a lot of piano arrangements on your record. Actually, there is a lot of key stuff. Not yeah. a lot of like um Lee Turner basically has played everything on our records except mm -hmm. for Peter Keys. Okay. And it's funny, we he's played on stuff for probably four years, and we never met him until probably a month ago oh wow you know we finally and we actually gave him one of our original uh, test pressings because he's almost like the fifth member of the band okay because he's he's been on almost every single track we do sure and now we're actually recording at his studios now so but yeah he doesn't there's not a ton of piano stuff in there but a lot of b3 stuff there's right. a lot of that stuff's kind of shoved in there well um you were telling me before y'all performed with the oaks yeah, we, we did uh, the Oak Ridge Boys. It was fun. We we went, I think, from playing with those guys to playing with Queensryche, like within like a short period of time. Like like as an opener? As or? an open support act, yeah. Okay. Which was pretty crazy. The Oak Ridge Boys were, of course, amazing and super gracious. And it just there's so much to say about yeah. them. And the yeah, Queensryche, awesome. I was a little bit like, it was at a festival. So I'm like, you know, that's a mixed festival. And we get done and I'm, I'm ta trying to meet the guys. Because I was, you know, I was a little kid. I was a big fan of theirs, you know. and and um, Of... Queensryche or both, the Oaks? Both bands. But, okay. the, but the funny thing was the Oak Ridge Boys were completely, like we had lunch with them. You yeah. know, that's how those guys are. You yeah. know, we were there, we're hanging out with them, we're having lunch with them. And it was more just like, this is just hanging out with, you know, like your uncles or something. It was right. the coolest thing. And uh, so I, I'm going to meet the Queensryche, Scott, you know, those guys. And I'm like, hey, big fan. And he's like, man, you know, my daughter loves your guys' stuff. And I thought he was kind of kidding me. But then my other guys are on the other side of the stage talking to the other guys in the band. They're like, oh right. yeah, man, our kids love your all stuff. I was like, oh, that's that's pretty cool. And and we've had such a weird go of it that we'll go, we'll do a show with Brantley Gilbert and then we'll go play with Slayer, um, not Slayer, Slaughter. That'd be crazy if we did a Slayer, a Slaughter <laughs> show. Um, we're going to go play a show with Dropkick Murphy 
Um, and we don't change who we are. We were out with Ted Nugent. Yeah. You know, I've toured with Aaron Lewis. I've toured with Eric Church. So I've gotten to do a lot of different kinds of things. And I've been able to just kind of do what I do. And it seems to resonate. Well, I love the fact that you get to do it. I just, I feel like more people are doing that. They just don't talk about it yeah. as much as, as you're able to because you're doing the performances. Yeah. Um, I mean, I, I, I was talking to one of the guys from Twisted Sister and he was telling me about the time he met Johnny Cash and how cool that was. And um, I, everybody's fans of, of other stuff. Yeah. It's just well, you should be. You in a box. I mean, music is, I mean, music is so, such a, an amazing thing because it, it, it touches all different kinds of, um, of lifestyles. Yeah. And everybody has a, a, a soundtrack that they want to listen to. But the, the best thing about now, I will say, things are fractured. But the good thing is, is it is not so much about just a singular kind of music because everybody has a playlist. Playlists are everything, you know? I mean, like you said, like Beyonce, you listen to that. You can listen to something really heavy. You can listen to something super, you know, whatever it is. You have the opportunity to kind of mix your own stuff and listen. Well, what of the whole album's out now? Yep. Well, or coming almost, out almost close, now. Close enough. Um, point to a couple of the songs on the record that you want people to make sure and not miss. Well, Devil on Both Sides, it's actually one of our opening songs. And that one just, it's just a kicker. You know, I think yeah. we, we kind of surprised people with that one. Um, we wrote, um, Bad Stretch of Road with a guy named Zach Williams. It was funny because I said, I want a three days grace country song, <laughs> which I, and he's like, okay, we can do that. And I think we did, um, you know, like I mentioned the song one more day with, we wrote with Peter Keys. There's, there's so much cool stuff in there. There's like six gun soul, obviously the title track. Right. And it's funny because there's no such thing as a six gun soul. We just made that phrase up, but I think it kind of resonates with people. I think they go, oh, I, I feel that way. So and, what is it? What is a six gun soul? Well, a six gun soul is kind of just, there's a lot of stuff like a gypsy soul, sort of. A six gun soul is a little bit more of a, a badass. Yeah. You know, like you you can beat me up, but you're not going to take me out. You know, I'm going to come back. You know, I've got a six gun soul. I'm, I'm going to rise and fight the for the occasion instead of just lay back and let me take, let you take me out. Okay. You know? Well, it's, uh, it's been a long ride. Yes as these songs have made it out, I'm not surprised that you've got more stuff ready to go because you've been taunting us with this journey for <laughs> a year and a half, yeah. if not longer. Um, so everybody needs to go check out all the rest of the songs, including this is the final chapter yep. coming out tomorrow. So go ahead and tell them where they can find all the rest of the stuff, how they can order the vinyl, where you're playing, all the things right there. RickMonroe.com has got everything that you can order from there in the merch section. You can obviously go to stores. It's going to be at any online um, retailer. It's obviously, it's streaming on every major streaming platform. So if you, there's no way you cannot find the record. So there you go. Rick Monroe, Rick Monroe and the Hitmen, you will find us. Very good. Thank you. Thanks for carving out the time to do well, this. Thank you for having me. I'm glad we were able to do it. Yeah. As, as the final chapter of this little this journey trip that you've been on. Yeah. yeah. So thanks, Rick. Thank you. And that's it for our interview with Rick Monroe from Rick Monroe and the Hitmen. tomorrow, Friday, April 12th, Rick will drop, which way is home. And that will complete the project for six gun soul. So visit rickmonroe.com, track down your copy, listen to all the songs online. And thanks Rick for stopping by and sharing it with all of us here at McMahon on keys. If you are not following us, I want to encourage you to do so. Subscribe to the podcast. Follow us on socials. We have a lot of interviews and a lot of new music that we're finishing up. So we're looking forward to sharing all of that with you guys. And if you've got thoughts or questions, you can email us at jeff at mcmahononkeys.com. For this week, thank you, thank you, thank you to Randy Allen for the great video work. Tommy Leland for recording and mixing the track for us and certainly the lovely Miss Maddie True for joining us on the song. I appreciate you lady. Until next time this is McMahon on Keys.